Welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable podcast, the only show that dares to be both on topic or on premise and on location or on premises. I'm your host, Stephen Foskett from Gestalt IT, and I've brought together a group of IT luminaries to discuss today's premise. The premise this week came from Gina, who suggested that maybe this whole concept of developer advocacy isn't exactly what people think it's going to be. So before we begin, let's meet who's on the panel today. Hi, I'm Josh Warcop. You can find me on Twitter at Warcop, and that takes you to warcop.com, where I write about various things very related to Tech Field Day. Hi, I'm Gina Rosenthal, and you can find me at G-M-I-N-K-S, G-Minks on Twitter, or at my company's website, digitalsunshinesolutions.com. I'm Andy Banta. You can find me at Andy Banta on Twitter. I have been a developer for about 30 years, and I advocate many things. Those two words do not belong together. <laughs> so here's the thing. Oh. It seems really? like uh, many companies these days are trying to build on this whole DevOps mentality to basically sell their products through a mechanism of developer advocacy instead of influencer relationships, which was the old way to do it, instead of analysts and press, which was the old, old way to do it. And so I don't know what came before that. But the point is, it seems like everybody's got a GitHub, everybody's got an open source project, everybody's asking for people to contribute. And my question is, quite frankly, is this a sensible business strategy? Does this, does this work? Is this likely to work? Uh, who wants to start? I'll certainly start. <laughs> um, it, it's, it, it works to some extent. So one of the nice things about GitHub and the ability to actually have a community of developers working on something means that you can get an awful lot more features into a product. One of the downsides of this is that developers often don't really build out products that are, are production ready or customer ready. So one of the one of the great examples of this that I've, I've spoken about several times in the past is when I was at VMware, we worked on developing the iSCSI initiator for VMware. And we initially started out using a Cisco reference implementation that had been hacked on by I don't know how many people <laughs> and was a complete load of crap. So we needed to actually throw it away and start over and write it over. And, and the line I used on stage at the time is that we were attempting to distribute software that was being maintained by 17 year olds. <laughs> and that's different how now? Because it seems like it's still a bunch of just random folks, right? How do you gate in good stuff versus the bad stuff well i mean you can you can pick and choose and that's that's largely what we did at vmware where we we took the pieces that were useful and developed them on our own and made them uh, robust and the the big difference was that we we completely disposed of the kernel pieces that had been part of the community source development and wrote our own and that's that's just an example Mm -hmm. So I, th I think um, there's a lot of power with community and there's a lot of power um, bringing developers together to do new things, especially when you take them out of the constructs, maybe, especially in a big organization like VMware, of what they normally their day to day responsibilities are. Uh, the reason why I have some questions about the field of developer advocacy and people going to them is kind of twofold. Number one, um, I see companies because they hear DevOps and they've seen that in the past developers got annoyed with infrastructure and got annoyed with operation for lots of really good reasons. And part of the reason is because they were developers. They're like, screw this. I'm going to go get what I need. I'm not going to deal with, you know, your stupid um, ITIL pipeline. I'm going to go make something that's much more realistic so I can build software, get it out the door and not have to wait for, for operations to get this stuff done. So I see a lot of, that's great if you're a developer focused company and you've got something that is for the developers. But I'm, what I'm seeing is lots of organizations that are infrastructure based that still requires an operator, whether that be a sysadmin, an SRE, a DevOps engineer, whatever you wanna talk about. 
to be able to set up the infrastructure so that the developers can go hit on things and become this community and do what they need to do. I think what's happening in a lot of times when people stand up a developer influencer program is they're like, we need to sell to developers because it'll do just like it was in the early cloud days. We'll let them swipe a credit card, get a little bit of our product, they'll love it. It'll get so good that they're going to have to buy it from us because that's all the developers want to use. And it's kind of a funky way to say, let me go embrace developers and put um, operational people to go and embrace them and help the developers do advocate for something. So well, that's really the point, isn't it? Because essentially there's nothing wrong with open source. No. There's nothing wrong with having uh, developers and end users be involved in the development of open source projects or of APIs or connectors or modules or whatever it is that you're trying to get. The problem in my mind is that a lot of developer advocacy, advocacy programs, just like a lot of influencer relationship programs are actually completely missing the point because they're so self-centered self in that they're focused on, they're not developer advocacy programs so much as they are developer marketing programs, just like influencer uh, relationship programs weren't influencer relationships, they were influencer marketing. In and that's beginning. a little bit different than advocacy, isn't it? Yeah, because I mean, that's what I did. I mean, I was one of the first ones that did a true influencer advocacy program in an operational role. And it was hard work. And this was at the time before marketing wanted me to do it and definitely before PR wanted me to do it. It took a lot of relationship building with both of those teams, as well as the operational customers that were vocal and speaking out about things to get them to trust me, to bring everything together and to let them interact with, you know, our, our higher ups in our organization to find out about timelines, to be treated like AR and PR. Um, and when, once marketing saw how, um, how many uh, leads, not leads, how many impressions we would get because they would interact with people and how much the, execs loved it they took it over and they did turn it into influencer marketing which is we'll give you swag we'll give you socks we'll give you whatever is the coolest new thing but it was never about listening to them as customers when they're like this really sucks and i need someone to talk to you about this and they just didn't even know how to make those relationships stick so the advocacy piece is very different than the marketing piece and i think you're right it is developer marketing versus advocacy right. yeah. Yeah, I think, I think a few of the companies, too, are looking at the marketing side of it as a developer advocacy piece of this, of, of trying to collect information and kind of use the program and the people that join it as part of an intake, right, of like, how do I, how do I build this into what I'm building as a product? And while it sounds fun as a marketing or influence or advocacy program, it's almost like a, a catch Right. Of like, I just want people in the program to give me feedback because and I don't want to pay them or I want them as customers or I want them as customers, too. Right. It's, it's almost mm -hmm. like a I want to market to the community. So I'm going to build a community yes. to get them as customers. Right. And, yeah. and the communities are very important to developers across the board. The, the way that you actually get questions answered is to uh, to you know, join the communities, talk to people in the community forums throughout many companies, the developer forums are the way that you actually figure out how things work, get problems solved. There's an awful lot of overlap between them. Uh, I mean, Stack Overflow is probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. uh, resources out there for developers to just figure out how, how I make this stop breaking. And it, it's a fantastic, I mean, community is a very important piece of this. Uh, the The idea that somehow the influence markers come in and play a part in this is, is the disconnect. And I, I mean, uh, Amy Lewis is one of the best influence marketers out there. She did a great job at fostering community, bringing people together, showing, you know, demonstrating that a community was out there. And at the same time, it, it's, I, I don't think that she necessarily understood exactly what developers needed to get their job done other than, they liked beer and bacon. Yeah. Well, and, and me, this is no slam on Amy. She's, she's a fantastic person. Well, let, let, me, let me feed on that one too. So I think this is another big challenge is that a lot of companies, especially in the enterprise tech space, 
actually do have no idea what it is. They don't really understand developers. They don't know them. They don't know what they want. And they do tend to glom onto things like pizza and bacon and beer in thinking, oh, well, that'll help build the community. That'll help, you know, me get developers, right? Yeah. And, do, and do you think some of it's part of, or, or part of the problem is that the community is disjointed? It's not just Stack Overflow anymore, right? It's I've got the Slack channel, I've got the Git, I've got all of these other places to go. So maybe the, the company has to give some sort of output of where we're actually going to build the community. Maybe it's not on Stack Overflow anymore. Maybe I, I'm, I'm trying to get everybody in, in Slack or something. Stack Overflow is, is one example, but I mean, yeah. the, the communities form themselves organically. It, it's the people who need the information who kind of gather together to share that information. And yeah. like the VMTN forums at VMware were, were a huge thing. Uh, lately, I've been poking around the NVIDIA forums and there's loads of good information in, in those forums on, on how to, you know, get your GPU working on this thing or this thing or whatever. And it's, it's all very up-to-date information and an awful lot of things that I'm looking at. It's like, Hey, this stuff was published last week and, and it's addressing the question I have today. So I think that's kind of the, to tie it all together, right? It, it because the, the, influencer, especially the developer marketing, um, influencer marketing, they have huge budgets. And um, I, I think that the goal, whatever the goal is of that company to put money behind it, to use this community, that's what should be analyzed, right? And, and that, I, I think in the end, that it is if it's successful or not, that is what happens. I don't think there's a lot of sense, because you're right. If you have a, a need for information, you're going to go to whatever vendor or big place it is that where the developers are answering questions and sharing information. But, you know, maybe if you're a big vendor realizing who is your audience, maybe your audience isn't developers, mm -hmm. but it's the, um, it's the sysadmins that need to become SREs or whatever platform engineers, whatever we're calling them, you know? I, I, think, I think part of where the influence marketing comes in is not that people who are actually developing product, but the people who, are writing scripts or attempting to do little bits and pieces. And those are the people who you get showing up at, like the hackathons at conferences yes. or the, um, you know, the, the, you know, bracket code bracket thing <clears throat> at VMworld. Those are the people who show up there and, you know, just want to, just want to noodle around with, with scripting and some code and, you know, make something do whizzy something or other. It's like, you know, make the asterisk bounce around the screen or whatever <laughs> they're doing these days. That, um, well, and that's, I, I think that's where influence marketing is, is drawing people in. And it, it doesn't have a whole lot of overlap with the, the people who are actually developing product. I don't know. That I, I think maybe the way it is now, I, I think the way we did it in the beginning, how do you help customers send your message out in their own words? And that means helping influencers you see that have a problem with you. How do you help them? How do you get their problem? Take it to the right product person, get the question answered, give it back to them and let them go and do what they will. And hopefully they'll, re they'll regurgitate that in their own words. And I think that the, I think that some of it is also like, there are all these places to go and the hackathons are great, but like if there's people that come together and if you're somebody that goes to a hackathon and you see you know, the Frank Denimans of the world there as well. And you get to meet him in person and, and then you are able to follow him, have a conference back and forth, you know, with him about your real questions, your real technical questions that draws you into a community that might live in Twitter. It might live here, it might live there, but then you're connected to the people, your skills grow, you're able to help somebody else. And it goes on and on and so on. So you're thinking it's, it's like a ramp up, right? Of like, how do I go broad and then ramp in people into... What, what I'm really trying to get to of, of sharing and collecting that data back and forth between a community and a company. Well, I think that it's, what's the goal? Is it sharing the data? Is it helping people have an easier time adopting your technologies? Um, but I do think it's from a, in, an individual perspective, whether it's operations or developer side, it's like Andy said, you have a need for information. If you're able to go and you feel safe and open enough to answer your question, it's probably really basic, but to you, it's like really, you know, it's, oh, mm -hmm. someone's gonna make them dumb. That's how I felt about some big admin. That was my first community. <laughs> like I used it a lot, 
but I never asked a question because those guys scared the hell out of me, right? So, um, but like, if you have this open aspect where people can come, they have a place where they can ask their question and then they gain confidence in it. And then that does help them learn more because they're connected right to the developers. That's how I see a good one working. Exactly. And actually just to, to shift gears a little bit, there was a second aspect of this that Stephen talked about, which is the idea that if you can actually influence developers, it's going to drive the way a company does business because the developers are going to push the ideas forward to, to actually um, to actually be the way the company does production work. And this is a, another piece where I, I see I, I see some breakdown in it in that yes, oftentimes the developers will go off and learn new tools and figure things out on their own and use whatever helps them get their job done faster. And the sometimes those things do get pushed up into the, the production aspects of the company. But I see one of the problems there is that lots of times developers do things because developers think they're cool <laughs> and it has very little to do with what the company actually wants to get accomplished. It's pretty common. It's, yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is a problem I've had in tech industry for a while from both sides of the coin, which is developers want to do one thing and product wants them to do something else. And they, they butt heads because product actually has some clue about what the customers want. <laughs> and developers just think they know what the customers want. And this is true in non-tech companies as well, where developers will have some idea of what they might think the customers of that company want. And the people who actually run the company have a much better idea of what the customers actually want because they're the ones who actually put together the concept of the company. And, and they're actually talking to the customers. Right? And they're yeah, actually yeah. talking to the customers. Hopefully. So this, Hope, hopefully <laughs> talking. This, this is one of the places where I see developer advocacy pushing the wrong direction. Right. And, I agree. And, and let me just say there that that a lot of this, a lot of these questions come down to a, a key challenge in this. It is this push and pull because on the one hand, you have to think about what does the company want? You know, what is the direction of the company, the goal of the company? You have to think about what do the developers want? What is their goal? Maybe even what is the goal of the marketers and the people who are involved in the developer advocacy programs? You know, they may have personal goals that may be somewhat different from both of those groups. And then at the same time, you have to understand, I think companies have to understand that these programs, fundamentally, they work or they don't work based on the enthusiasm from the community and, the, and, the, and the building a genuine community that serves people. And if the community doesn't serve people, then the people aren't going to use, they're not going to be involved. Right. And then that's that. Just to clarify, the the marketing <clears throat> people and the marketing aspect that comes into this, and in that the marketing people are attempting to influence the developers of typically another company mm -hmm. and attempt to have that company have have the developers of that company kind of push the direction of that company as opposed to what the, the management of that company needs. So the, the marketing is typically outbound more than it is inbound. Absolutely. I, yeah. I agree with this completely. And I've been doing, I mean, I'm working on this with, for one of my clients actually, and to understand if that works or who is the real audience that you work toward. And one of the things we've been looking at in enterprise companies, like traditional enterprise companies that are moving to a cloud operating model um, is that they are also moving how they, how they run internal IT. So if a developer wants to pick up a brand new tool that he thought was really cool from his new, you know, somebody gave him a bunch of t-shirts and some beer and pretzels and he's good, he's gonna try this. <laughs> and thinking that he can push it up, that's not how it works anymore. It's very, very regimented. You have a, in a lot of cases, a platform architect, that's the person that evaluates and this developer might push this forward and say, hey, I found this great new tool, it's gonna solve all the problems. But if the platform architect doesn't, it doesn't fit into the plan for what he's building, it'll never see the light of day. This person will never get the resources to use it beyond his one thing, and he might get in trouble for using it. So I think as we've gone through this whole digital transformation, we're coming around the corner where we see traditional organizations really trying to figure out that DevOps cycle and how they implement it from an operations standpoint and build this cloud operating model. Um, they also are bringing a lot of um, practice and, and um, efficiencies to their organization where you just can't 
depend on the on, on the idea that developers can push a thing upwards anymore. It's just you got lucky with you know, Amazon got lucky, did it with cloud, and now it's we're in a different stage. So one thing that I'll, I I want to change gears here a little bit. Um, let's talk about how to make developer advocacies not bunk, right? So if if we think that a lot of these programs are uh, self-serving, misguided, uh, maybe not even serving the company's needs, even though you know the companies are the ones driving them. How can we? What do we have to suggest to make these things better? I think one thing you know that immediately springs to mind is, like I said, kind of go where the people are instead of trying to make the people come to you. Uh, make it useful to them instead of uh, trying to make it self useful to you. Uh, what else, you know? How, how can we make these things great? Yeah. So so creating a safe space for sharing of knowledge mm -hmm. seems to be at the top of the list. I think we've talked about that a couple of times already, right? Wh where can I ask the dumb question and I'm not gonna get you know, slapped down by the platform architect, right? <laughs> I want to have some knowledge sharing and in, 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 in that community. And if it's not a safe space, I'm leaving, I'm going somewhere else. I'm gonna go find another company that offers that because I wanna ask the dumb question. Going to Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess, a couple aspects of that. Uh, it's um, it, it would be nice if developer advocates actually were homegrown out of the developer community, mm. rather than being people who are uh, picked out of marketing and say, "Hey, go do go be a developer advocate." And I mean, it's difficult because an awful lot of developers are not very sociable people. Um, sometimes not even very friendly people. This is true. Very, uh, <laughs> yeah. And it's sometimes a little bit difficult to do that. I think the developer advocate, number one, if you're an operations company, are you really, that's really who you want to talk to as a developer? Is that really who you want to talk to? And so um, that, that's what I'd say is who is your audience? Because I think operations people need a lot of help right now and not in a bad way, just that everything's changing. All of the things that we did with three tier architectures for the last it's 20 years totally is changed. totally changed. I mean, just that, you know, we were here at Tech Build Day and we saw that we, we talked to Facebook and, and what Intel is doing with Alibaba. So like completely different architectures and completely different applications. So if you've got an operations tool or, a, you know, a platform, why aren't you talking to the operations people to get them up to speed on what they need and, or provide, and some of it is just providing the content, because think about it, all of the marketing stuff, and y'all know I do product marketing, but y'all make fun of the marketing slides. Oh, it's the marketing slides. Here we go. <laughs> but it's true. You get on the website and it's so beautiful and you a nice feel and they spend hours and hours on that. But like, where's the product? I need to know if the product is this, this, this. Where do I find that? And you Google it and you find it in a forum on Reddit or yeah. Stack Overflow. And right. That you should be making sure is available to your customers. And you should make a safe space for your customers or your prospective customers to come to you and say, this doesn't work. Right? That actually was the second point I wanted to come to is something that was was pushed heavily in the 90s when, when I was first getting into this industry is the idea of egoless development. Don't be afraid to ask the questions. Don't be afraid to take the criticism when somebody comes along and says, hey, that doesn't, it doesn't work the way it should, or this is a, a better way to do that, whatever. And lots of engineers actually embrace that and when you bring marketing into the mix and you you gamify development you you are getting rid of the egoless aspect of it and and i think we need more ops advocacy as we're I hearing absolutely. right we're as we've seen over the 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 past few months and the presentations even recently right it's changing so dramatically mm -hmm. that the ability to absorb and then actually put it into practice or we're, we're killing ops teams they're 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 falling over with the inability to operate so so maybe it's maybe there's a, a way to shift developer and influencer over to how do we support the ops teams right i think so and i think what's happened is you've got you you you've got product man managers that look and say oh this is definitely fits that devops industry so we need a developer advocate and we need maybe you don't maybe you need drop the dev <laughs> and maybe you don't even need an advocate. You just need a place where you put your information. So in summary, I, I think that uh, what I'm hearing is that, uh, number one, that, that uh, these programs need to be much more focused on uh, 
helping de developers to do the right thing instead of forcing them in the direction that you want. Uh, you know, they need to be focused on, uh, you know, like I said, meeting the developers where they are. They need to be focused not so much on the uh, company's objectives. And yet, uh, again and again and again, we see companies that are just trying to do this, in my opinion, all wrong. It's, it's you know, um, why isn't anyone on our Slack? Why isn't anybody in our forums? You know, how come they didn't come to our, mm -hmm. our meetup? Uh, how come, you know, and, and this whole relentless push toward metrics and sort of gamification, like you said, really does a disservice to this. And I think that that's maybe the reason that some of us feel like this stuff is bunk. Yeah. And then another thing that I heard Josh bring up here at the end, and I think that that's very true. I don't want to open up a whole other can of worms, <laughs> but when you're looking at DevOps, make sure that it includes dev and ops. Unfortunately, it's kind of amusing. Uh, some of the developers I talk to say that DevOps is really just ops ops. <laughs> and some of the operations people I talk to say that DevOps is just dev dev. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of amusing that they both have different perspectives on that. And again, I don't want to open up too much of a can of worms, but I do want to give you guys a chance to kind of sum up. So Andy, uh, what do you think? Is this bunk? Are we in the right direction here? Uh, I think there's some of the right direction. I think it's largely bunk. I think that developers on their own have developed a, a, their own community and often are very capable of getting their jobs done on their own. Uh, I think that the idea that there's actually a community of them that, that's supported by uh, influence marketing is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think that in some cases the influence marketing pushes it into being a bad thing. And as I said, the, the idea of egoless development is not something that I've heard for a while. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's because we never actually learn anything from history. <laughs> So I think um, I, I think people need to go back to the basics. You know, I agree with everything Andy said. Um, I think that you you have to figure out if you're going to go and build a developer advocacy uh, program. Why? Why are you building it? Who's your real audience? Is that really your audience? And could it just could you fix it with content marketing? Putting all of your content in a good place, maybe having somebody watching for people with those exact questions going and answer them, make, it, make a place where they know they can go to ask a question about your product and what does it do and come, you know, and ha get the, someone's watching it to answer it for them. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> like where, where do I go to get the content and, and how do I, you know, ask the questions that need to be asked and continue down that same thread. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for joining us here on Premises for the on-premise IT roundtable podcast. This is recorded live at Tech Field Day 25 in Santa Clara on uh, April 8th, 2022. Uh, we will be posting more episodes and more videos from this event soon. Uh, but before we go, uh, let's just go through the uh, panelists once again. Uh, where can we connect with you and continue the conversation? Uh, at Andy Bent on twitter.com. And if, if you hit me up there and you have something specific you want to talk to me about, I, I'd be happy to talk to you in person or by email. Um, G Minks on twitter.com. And this is what I help customers do. I've done it for a very long time. Um, my company's website is digital sunshine solutions.com. At Warcop on twitter.com is the best place to get me. And I will engage in tweets and direct messages. And as for me, I'm at S. Foskett on most uh, social media sites. And you can find me at fishtaltit.com pretty much, as well as techfieldday.com. So uh, this podcast is available on YouTube, as well as on most podcast applications. If you enjoyed it, please do give us a su subscription, uh, give us a rating, give us a review. Uh, that always does help. This podcast is brought to you by gestaltit.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. For show notes and more episodes, go to gestaltit.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>